So you decide you want to sell on Etsy. You put in all the time and effort to create your products, get your shop all set up, and launch it out into the world only to hear crickets. It happens to so many Etsy sellers, and then we start racking our brains trying to figure out where we went wrong and why we're not making sales. I've seen it time and time again and know how frustrating it can be. But after nine years of selling on Etsy and building a top 1% shop, I've come to realize the factors that can truly make or break an Etsy business. So if you're someone who's done everything you know to do and you're still not getting the sales you want, you're going to want to lean in here because today I'm going through the top four reasons that Etsy sellers struggle to make consistent sales and what to do about it. All right, before we dive into reason number one, why you might not be making as many sales as you want, I want to let you know I'm going to be giving an extra pro tip at the end of the video. That's my absolute key when it comes to starting and growing a profitable Etsy shop. So you definitely want to stick around to the end, but for now, let's hop into this reason number one, and that is that you could be offering the wrong product. Now, I know this seems like a given. Of course, you need to offer the right product to be able to be successful, but you'd be surprised how many people don't even think twice about this when deciding what they're going to sell. Etsy is very different than other marketplaces like Amazon or eBay that you might go to buy things. And there's a different type of shopper on Etsy than there are on those platforms. And there are specific types of products that work better to sell on Etsy than marketplaces like those. So the same thing that works for an Amazon seller, let's say, might not work for an Etsy seller. You have to think about the type of shopper that are on Etsy and they're primarily there to buy one of a kind, unique items that can be gifted or a lot of times customized or personalized. So there are two parts to this. You could be offering the wrong general broad product type and offering items in a product category that just doesn't really do well on Etsy specifically, or you could be offering the right product type, but in the wrong style. This comes down to things like style and trend elements. So depending on what you're selling, it could be your font choice, your color scheme choice, patterns that you're using, scents, hardware types. It's going to vary widely from product niche to product niche, but you have to make sure that what you're offering in terms of style and trend elements are in demand currently and not something that was in demand and now has faded out. Trends come and go, so it's super important to stay on top of it and make sure that what you're offering is actually being highly searched on the platform currently and is something that people are really looking for on Etsy. Now, there are a lot of ways you can go about validating your ideas and doing this kind of product research to to see what actually is in demand, you can search on Etsy itself, looking for what's selling really well currently by looking at the popular now and bestseller tags. You can also use Etsy specific research tools like Sales Samurai, which we'll talk more about in just a minute. Either way, the point is that we're not just offering things that we like personally, but we're doing some research to gain data on what's currently selling, what's currently in demand on Etsy, and we're going where the numbers and the demand already lie. Now, if this is your first time hearing anything about trend elements and style elements, I want to come alongside you and help guide you in this process because I know it can be a little bit intimidating if you're not really familiar with what this means. So I have a whole trend elements cheat sheet available to you completely for free linked in the description box below that you can grab to help get some ideas going for your product niche and what some of these trend elements that you could incorporate into your products might be. All right, so if you think about this, you know that you're offering an in-demand product type in a trending style with incorporated trend elements, then you might want to think about this reason number two that you might not be making sales and that is that your shop has an unprofessional appearance. We all know how important it is and how crucial it is for someone who's landing on your shop to immediately feel like you are a professional, that this is a professional business and that they can immediately trust you. So when your shop appears somewhat unprofessional or put together in a random way that doesn't appear credible, you instantly lose trust with your potential shopper and they're likely to just click off of your shop and move on to the next one. Now, there are a lot of factors that go into building a shop that really appears professional, appears cohesive, but I'm going to mention my top four here that you would want to really take into consideration and think about if you could level up or improve these in any way. The first one is having really professional looking branding. So when I say branding, I'm talking about all of the visual elements that go into your shop that give your shop an identity, such as your shop icon or logo, your banner image, your profile picture, and even your about section and the pictures and information that you give there. You'd be surprised how many people leave some of these areas blank and don't even input anything for their branding, which is the first clue to the bottom that this shop probably isn't trustworthy. So in addition to just having all of those areas completed and having them filled out, you want to make sure that anything visual is of utmost quality. So for instance, you don't want a really grainy or pixelated banner image. This comes down to making sure that you're creating your banner image and downloading it as the right file type and in the right resolution. You also want to make sure that all the colors you're using in your branding, in your banner, your shop icon or logo, and even in your staging and your thumbnail pictures are all cohesive. You want everything 
tending to work together and to feel very planned out and not random or scattered. Also at the top of your shop page, you'll see a section for your shop announcement. This is an area that you can fill out in your settings that will give an announcement to whoever lands on your shop page. But the way you word your shop announcement also can either give a great feeling of quality and professionalism, or it can give the feeling that you're just somebody that hopped on Etsy and is doing this as a side hobby, which doesn't instill much trust in your buyer. So look at how your shop announcement is worded and think to yourself how you can up the professionalism of how it sounds. In this, we always want to come across as an actual business. So one tip here is to use we language instead of I language. So in my shop announcement, I would never say, thanks for visiting my shop. I would say, thanks for visiting our shop. And instead of saying something like, I love to do this as my hobby or thanks for supporting my interest. You're going to make it about the buyer's experience and you're coming across as a team using our and we language. So you might say, thanks so much for shopping with us. We're so honored to be able to offer you quality products that you'll enjoy. Hopefully you can hear the difference there in just the little bit of change of language and how it really comes across a lot more professional and as a team, even if you're just a one person show, this kind of language is going to instill a lot more trust than coming across as someone who's just doing this on the side. The next one is something I already mentioned before, but I really want to hit home with this point that all of your thumbnail images on your shop page need to be cohesive in the way that they work together and appear together as one full shop. Now each one is on a different listing. So it may be tempting to think, well, that's an individual listing and forget about the fact that when someone actually lands on your shop page and is looking at your shop as a whole, they're going to be seeing all of your thumbnail images next to each other. So they can either appear really cohesive and draw the buyer in, or they can appear random and scattered and like they have nothing to do with each other, which we don't want. So think about in your listing images, what props you're using, what staging you're using, even for infographics, what colors are you using? You want everything to appear like it works together. It's one consistent brand. It's one consistent aesthetic across the whole shop. And again, you just want to make sure that it doesn't appear scattered. You're offering one specific type of niche, one product type, because we don't want it to appear confusing to the buyer. We want to position ourselves as the specialist and the expert in one thing, which is going to help immediately instill trust and confidence in our buyer. All right. So let's say that you have these first two reasons totally covered. You know, you're offering a product that's in demand on Etsy and you've done everything you can to make your branding, your whole shop feel very professional, then you might want to think about this third reason. So the reason that you're not making sales could be that your listings just aren't being found. You can do everything you need to do in terms of making sure that you're offering a great product. You've got all of your branding, but if you're not creating your listings in a really smart and strategic way, they can easily be buried on the 50th or 60th page of search results. We have to have some smart tactics going into creating our listings to make sure we're positioning them in a way that they're going to be discovered in the search results. A huge part of this comes down to SEO optimization. This is where we're making use of search engine optimization, also known as SEO in our listings in strategic places to make sure that Etsy's algorithm can quickly and easily identify accurately what our listing is all about, what the product is and connect it with the right searcher who's searching for something related to what we're offering. This has to do with how you're crafting your titles, your tag section on your listings and your product description. We're not just throwing up random words and phrases in those areas and hoping to be found, we're doing keyword research on the front end to make sure we know what phrases are actually being highly searched on the platform. And then we're going to take those and plug them in almost as a cue to the algorithm saying, Hey, this listing is a great match for that phrase that that shopper typed in. So there's two parts of this. Number one is to think like your customer and think about what phrases they would likely be searching, which might be different than how you would initially think to describe your product. And the second part of this is doing actual keyword research, looking up data with a research tool like Sales Samurai. So Sales Samurai has a lot of different features and tools that Etsy sellers can use. But one of my favorite things is the Chrome extension. So once you have the Sales Samurai Chrome extension installed, you can come on Etsy and start your research just in the search bar of Etsy by typing in something that you're thinking of. So for example, I might start typing in something like kids. And then I can see as I start typing in, Etsy is giving me some populated suggested phrases for things that have been recently searched or are consistently searched, which already start to give me some good ideas. But then I can see over here, this little blue number is my sales Samurai Chrome extension showing me the estimated monthly search volume for each of these phrases. Then I can click where it says over here, 500 more to come over to the page where sales Samurai is going to give me all of these different related keyword phrases to what I started typing in the estimated 
updated monthly search volume for each and more data. So I can look through these and see if the things that I'm thinking of offering are highly searched or if the search volume is somewhat low. I can also use the filters to put in the amount of search volume I'm looking for. So let's say I want to find keyword phrases that have at least 2000 searches per month and I want them to contain the words kids and Valentine. So here it will highlight for me in the results, the ones that contain the words kids and Valentine, and I can narrow down my search even more. So let's say I'm looking through these and I see, oh, kids Valentine sweatshirt. That's a good idea. I can click on this and it'll take me right back to that search on Etsy where it's typed in kids Valentine sweatshirt. I can then go through these and start to look at what might be a bestseller to get some ideas of what's currently working really well on the platform. Now, if I'm wanting to even go deeper into my keyword research, I can come to Sales Samurai's website and use the keyword search tool to type in what I'm thinking of. So I'm going to type in kids, Valentine's sweatshirt. And here it gives me all of the data that I would need to go even deeper with this, including the search volume, the click through rate, the amount of competition for that keyword phrase. I can see keyword phrases that are most trending related to that on Etsy as well as Google. And I can look through the top listings that are ranking for that keyword phrase to get more information on those listings. I can see things like the price spread, the different amounts of shipping days that people using that keyword phrase are offering, shipping costs, and pretty much all of the information that I would need to do this kind of keyword and product research. So if you've never used a tool like this before and you're interested in trying out Sales Samurai, I do have a link in the description box below for a free three-day trial. And you can also input the code Kate20 when you sign up to get 20% off your subscription if you decide to use it beyond that free trial. I think you're gonna love it. And I especially wanna thank Sales Samurai for sponsoring this portion of today's video. So like I mentioned before, once you have your highly searched keyword phrases identified from doing research, then you're gonna plug those in as closely as possible to match from your title, to your tag section, to your product description. In the product description, we're not keyword stuffing by just putting a list of those keywords, but we're organically and conversationally weaving those keywords in to what we would already be writing in our description. So it makes sense, it's readable, but it's still peppered with those keyword phrases for the algorithm to take note of so that it knows this is a great match for that shopper's query. We're also needing to think about filter qualifiers here. So what I mean by filter qualifiers are specific areas of the listing that would qualify our listing to be shown and ranked high to a searcher who is using search filters. The searcher could apply a filter for a certain color or a certain holiday, a certain size or price point. There are lots of different filters that shoppers can use to narrow down the search. Not all shoppers use filters, but a lot do. So when we're crafting our listings, we need to take into consideration specifically the category section, the attributes section, and our price point. Some of these areas on the listing are optional and it's easy to just skip over them, but the more that you can fill out that accurately represent what your product is, the more you're positioning your listing to be found in those filtered searches. And when it comes to price point, a lot of times it can be a little bit of trial and error to figure out what price point works the best for that specific listing. But one thing to take note of is if someone is searching, let's say with a filter that is $50 and under, if your listing is priced at $51, you're not gonna be shown in the results. So it's better to just take a few dollars off, price it at maybe $48 or $49 to make sure that you have the potential to be shown in that filtered search. Now, if you've got all of that down, a couple more reasons your listings might not be found would be number one, your listing still has a low listing quality score. The listing quality score is one of the seven factors that Etsy's algorithm uses to rank and to decide what order listings should be shown to shoppers. So this is like your listings individual score. It doesn't take into account the shop as a whole. It's just for that specific listing, but it's hard to get a high listing quality score without many sales on that listing. So in general, the more sales you make and the more it converts into a sale, the higher that listing quality score is going to be. But you might be wondering, well, how do I get sales? If I'm buried in the beginning, I don't have a chance for this listing to be shown. How am I gonna get those sales to start building that score? And that's a great question. One thing that you can do from the very beginning is to start to build on a social platform and to drive traffic from either social media or from another external platform like Pinterest, YouTube, or a blog. Anywhere that you can get outside of Etsy and start letting people know about your shop and driving traffic is gonna help you build build that momentum from the very beginning and start driving some of those first few sales on your own so that your listing quality score starts to get boosted and then starts to rank organically higher in the Etsy search. Now, like I said, the listing quality score is your score for that individual listing, but you also have a shop wide score, which is called your customer and market experience score. This takes into account your shop as a whole and gives it a score also for the 
purpose of ranking. So shops with a low customer and market experience score aren't going to likely rank as high in the search as shops with an excellent customer and market experience score. So there are several things that go into making this shop score, one of which is having a lot of great five-star reviews. So the quicker and sooner you can start encouraging your customers to leave you feedback in the form of reviews, hopefully excellent five-star reviews, the quicker that shop score is going to be boosted and the more and more you're going to be ranking higher in the search. One thing that hurts the score is if you have any strikes against your shop. So one of these is intellectual property. You want to make sure you're really careful not to offer any products that could potentially be looked at as stealing someone else's intellectual property, which could get a strike against your shop. All right. So all of that goes into helping your listings be found. So now let's say you've got all of these things that we've talked about covered. You're good to go on product type, getting your listings found, but there could be another problem, which is that they're being found, but they're not actually converting into sales. Again, there could be a lot of different reasons for this, but I'm going to highlight the few that I think are most important that could really move the needle if you can up level and improve a couple of these things. The first one, and arguably the most important one, is having quality listing images. You have 10 photo slots in each listing, and I would highly recommend you use as many of those as possible in a really strategic way. So we want to be showing the product from different angles, if there's specific details that you need to get closer up for, if it's offered in different variations, you want to show images of that. You can even educate through your images by offering infographics with important information on it, or even adding text to your photos to pinpoint what exactly the shopper is seeing in the photograph. We have to be really intentional about leveling up our quality of photos and standing out from the crowd. It can be really easy, especially as let's say a print on demand seller to just use the same mock-up images that everyone's using that comes straight from the POD company. But using the same images as everyone else is not going to help your product stand out. It's likely just going to be looked over in the sea of other thumbnails that are right next to it. You've got to think about how to create images and photos that are going to stand out from the crowd and appear very professional, very well done, and give a very thorough look at what your product actually is. Another mistake that can be made in this area is with your product description and not giving your buyer enough information to feel really comfortable and confident making the purchase. The more information the shopper can gather from both the photo section and the product description, the more likely they are to really feel like they have a grasp on what they're purchasing. Remember, they don't get to put their hands on it. They don't get to feel it or touch it or see it in person. So ordering something online requires the seller to really go above and beyond and giving the buyer that information through photos and a description to help them feel really confident that this is the right product for them. You also want to take into consideration shipping cost. The buyer could love everything they see, love the product and go all the way to the checkout page and then see that there's an additional shipping cost and drop off there. So when at all possible, I always encourage sellers to offer free shipping as this is the best and easiest way to eliminate that friction in that step and eliminate the possibility of the buyer dropping off there. Now I do realize it's not possible for every product type to have free shipping. Sometimes it just doesn't make sense, but when you can and think about how you could possibly build that shipping cost into your price point and offer free shipping. And then again, coming back to the price point, this is something that will also make or break your listing in terms of converting into a sale. We never want to be the lowest priced or the highest priced in our niche. We want to look at what others are offering this similar product for and end up somewhere in the middle that's a reasonable area where you can still be competitive, but make a healthy profit. This may take a little bit of trial and error and trying some different price points to see what works, but there are tools out there to help with this, like Sales Samurai's Profit Calculator and Price Spread when you use the keyword research tool. And you can also just look at what other successful listings on Etsy are selling for to get a ballpark range and then decide what would be the right price point for you in that competitive but still having a healthy profit zone. One little key here if you're offering physical products is to think about how you could reduce the amount you're spending to purchase materials and supplies by possibly purchasing from a wholesale company rather than a retail store. So for example, if I've been purchasing purchasing all of my supplies at places like Michael's or Hobby Lobby, which are retail stores, it might help me to reduce the amount that I'm spending on those supplies if I were to source something similar from an actual wholesale company. Wholesale companies offer similar items in bulk for a hugely discounted price. So if you're able to source some of those wholesalers, then it's going to take down your initial cost, which means that you could afford to have a lower, more competitive price point and still be making some profit. All right, friends. So those are the four areas that I see people struggle with the most in terms of leveling up, improving to make sales. But I do have one pro tip for you that is my absolute key when it comes to getting that momentum going in your shop in the beginning. And it's something that I alluded to a little bit earlier, but I really want to make sure we're understanding the importance of this. And this is proactive external marketing. 
So it can be great to have internal marketing, which would be where you're paying to run Etsy ads on the platform, but I found the most effective way to drive traffic in the beginning is to pick one or two external platforms to let people know about your shop and to drive them to purchase from your shop. So like I mentioned earlier, this could be a social media platform like Facebook, Instagram, TikTok. This could be a search engine platform like YouTube or Pinterest, or even something like a blog or via email marketing. There are a lot of different ways to do this, to get out there and to share the news about your shop, to share that it's open, to spread the word about what you're offering. Because remember, people won't know that your shop even exists unless you tell them. So for the Etsy algorithm to sort of kick into gear, to start noticing your listings and ranking them higher and higher, it's up to you to get that momentum and that traction going in the beginning by driving some of those first initial sales yourself. Now, if you're like, I have no clue where to even begin with that, I've got you covered. I've got a video that I just released recently that covers my top three marketing strategies and tactics for doing exactly this. So I've got that video teed up for you here. You can just click or tap the square on the screen to hop over and watch that. And don't forget as well to click the link in the description box below to grab your free trend elements cheat sheet. That's going to help you as you're analyzing what sort of style and trend elements you could incorporate into your products. Talk soon, friends. Okay.